Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of the Sulky Show. Here we are, late October, and the season's still going. First of November, and we have the Billy Williams Memorial Crocker Gold Final at Tier Prince. Yeah, round two, which, of course, attempted to stage the Crocker Gold back in September. Uh, we had a light, uh, an, a light malfunction that day, uh, but we're back for more, and we've really got a good feel for uh, the 2020 renewal of the Crocker Gold. And we've got a, a top class field for tonight's edition of the Sulky Show. As ever, we've got the wonderful guru herself, Sarah Thomas. How are you, Sarah? I'm good, thank you, Darren. How are you? Yeah, all, uh, all well and good and jealous. I see you're on the gin and tonic. Well, it's become a weekly thing, hasn't it? I haven't got a drink problem. Just weekly, is it? Just weekly? Uh, maybe twice weekly. <laughs> And look at this star-studded uh, cast we have for you. Two guys who were involved in the Crocker Gold on Sunday. Uh, Joseph Riley. How are you, Joseph? I'm good, thanks, Darren. How are you? Yeah, all, all good. Looking forward to the weekend. And uh, we've got uh, Hugh Menzies. Or is it Hugh Mengers? Mengers. Mengers, yeah. When in Rome. Yes. And how yes. are you, Hugh? You in good form? Yeah, yeah, very well. Done very well. Looking forward to the weekend. Looking forward to the weekend. Well, we're looking forward to the Crocker Gold in particular, but it's a wonderful card at Tier Prince on uh, a Sunday. And well done to all the, the owners, trainers, drivers, all the professionals uh, uh, alike for keeping the, the show on the road and the track. Um, we've had a great season. We, it continues this coming Sunday. We've got the Croc, the Group 1 Croc. Seven horses lining up in the 2020 renewal. I think uh, when we were due to have uh, round one back in September, I think Rocky Mambo has drawn one. Merrington moving up has got pole position. We've got two drivers heavily involved in this year's race. We've got Joseph Riley, who's driving Air Paparazzi. It comes out of Barrier 6. And Hugh, who drives Cash All, it comes out of 7 and also knows the horse coming out of 2 very well. That is a loose change and it's fair to say guys you're both driving horses that have just been a revelation over the last few weeks and the last few months we'll start with you joseph with the air paparazzi the the five-year-old air paparazzi has been in in marvelous form and you know two very good wins at tier prince has won five times this year you know you've done a sub two minutes you've done 158 and one i mean this horse is just just finding his feet and just climbing the ladder. Yeah, um, definitely we're absolutely over the moon with him. Um, I think he's give everyone a, a shock this year of um, actually how far he's went. I know when he come to us and we bought him, we didn't we didn't certainly think that would be where we are now. Um, obviously, we did see potential in the horse and stuff that we liked, so that's obviously why we bought him and we've got him. Um, but he's just, every time he's went out, he's he's given more and more and he's got better and better. So we're absolutely over the moon of him. I mean, I'm just looking at his record. I mean, I mean, last year he had quite a few races last year. You know, he was winning at the likes of stand-up last year. Of course, yeah. Um, I was actually at that meeting myself. I watched him win the heat and final at stand-up. Um, he won the final very comfortable, to be honest with you. Um, but I will... I was watching him at York this this season at the start of the season, like on the live stream, and um, it was it was getting like beating some clocks of like two minutes, two ones and stuff. But it, but he wasn't far behind. Uh, I just think there was if we could have if we did get him and we could like get his head in front, build his confidence up, then we had something to work with. And touch wood, the the plan worked and it, and it all went well. So I mean, how does it feel now? You're going into you know, the most prestigious race of the year with a, you know, a, li a live contender. Definitely, a million percent. Um, it's it's unexplainable, to be honest with you. It sort of hasn't sunk in. Um, I thought about it all week. The, the week sort of flew by up there. Now, I'm normally pretty nervous for a race, and I will be very nervous on the come Sunday, but just this week can't go quick enough for us, to be honest with you, to get to, get to Sunday and um, get out there and, and do our best, to be honest. And what are you thinking? I mean, is it are you going over the, the, the how the race will be run in your head at the moment? Of course. I mean, every driver will tell you the same thing that the 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 
you plan the race out in your head over and over again and every different scenario, every different outcome of what could happen and what can happen. But as a lot of drivers will tell you, to try and set a game plan in a race for it to be successful, the other nine or ten horses in the race have to do what you want them to do and 99% of the time that, that doesn't work out. So it's um it's all it's all well and good coming up with the scenarios of what you're gonna do and what you're not gonna do, but it's it's all about the um the day of the night and that so we'll have to wait and see. And you're coming out of the six hole? Coming out the six hole, yeah. Ideally it's not the best draw in the world. Um I do like being drawn out from the rail a little bit on Tur Prince. Um I just think horses get away better from like the three hole, maybe it's the three or four hole better than than the one hole. That's just my personal opinion. Um, he's led from the five hole twice there, pretty comfortable. So obviously with um with another another step out, we're drawn six this time, and the horses that we've got on the inside of us well, and on the outside of us, as far as I'm concerned, are the best horses in the country at the minute. So it might not be as easy to to accomplish that um, movement this time, but. Like I say, we'll just we'll just have to wait and see see on the night on the day. Sorry of, of how it's going to unfold. But you know, judged by the form he's been in this year, and you know, clocking that one fifty eight one, he's he he's a player. Oh, listen, definitely, definitely. I know. Listen, we're, it's we're, we're coming into the race as far as we're concerned as as the major underdog. Um, like I say, we're racing against the best horses in the country. But if we didn't think he had a chance of winning or he didn't have the tools to put it all together, then we wouldn't have entered him. Um, I genuinely don't think we're at the bottom of this horse yet. Like I say, every time we'll go out, he just keeps giving more and getting better. And who knows where he's going to stop. So the last the last um, couple of wins he had at Tur Prince in the Anto Russell Memorial, he, um, he won that by about six or seven lengths. He won, he won the last quarter of the mile himself. Same as the race gone Sunday, he pretty much run from the quarter pole home by himself. Um, so we're hoping with, with um, a bit better company that if, if something does come up on you and you're in that good of a position and something does come up come up on you, I might push him a bit harder. We, we might draw that bit extra out of him. It could go the other way. I, I really don't know. We'll just have to um, see what he does. Now, this man's drawn wide here. Hugh, Crocker yeah. Gold. I mean, what would it mean to you? I mean, listen, you know, you've been around, been there, done it, bought the T-shirt on most of the big races around around the country. I mean, to win a crop, what would it mean? Yeah, yeah, Dan, it's the biggest race of the year. As far as I'm concerned, I've, I've always kind of been a hard track fan. Muscle Bears, Trigans, Aberys was fantastic. The hard track's where the sport's best seen, and especially under the floodlights, it's, it's the best sport in the world. Um, so, yeah, it, it would be, without question, my biggest win ever. No question about it. And what, have, you had, have you driven in the crop before? No. I, I think, Dan, if, if memory serves me right, I, may be, I think I ran second in the first ever heat of the Crock of Gold way back. Um, I think the horse that beat me was Scarlet and Gold, Alan Wallace. Uh, and I was on a horse for Hamish Muirhead, actually called Script. Um, and I think I was second in that heat. No, I don't think we made the final that year. So, no, I don't think I've ever driven in a final. Well, look, look there are two horses in the race you know really well. Now, yeah. Cash All, you've got the seven hole. You're on the wide outside. But just like Air Paparazzi, Cat, now Cash All, admittedly, he's had more races. He's had 40 plus starts. It's a six year old. But the form this fella's been in over the last few weeks has just been, it's been phenomenal. I mean, and the times he's been clocking, I mean, you know, what is it? I mean, has something just clicked? How would you describe this improvement? No, he's always shown promise, Dan. I've been hiding this horse since it was three. I said to Hamish and, and Bob, this could be your best horse. I think maybe being Kiki Colt, I think there's there's a few stallions in the country, Kiki Colt maybe, Dunbeg, one or two others, seem to produce their horses later. As maybe he falls into that bracket, but he has had a lot of silly, niggly issues. He needs everything. Um, this year we got him at the start of the year uh, working at home. He was flying. He was going fantastic. He was coming home in unbelievable box. Um, and we took him down. I think Mick Grellis drove him in a C-class race. 
Everything went fine. Think you're on second or third that day. Everything was looking good. Came home, cast himself in the box. So that was the vet to him, and he was off, I think, for about eight weeks. Um, he came back, and I think his first start back, um, he was beaten by Lions Maverick um, in 59 and a half, and he went just a tad under 59 that day, so he went high 58. He was drawn the second line with a few runs at Corby Wood and tightened him up. So although I missed the day that he won, um, it was Michael O'Malley that was on him, the day he went 56 and 8, I was very, very confident he would win that race. The, the time was a bit of a surprise, but I was fairly confident he would win that race. Um, as I say, he's, he's just had a, he's a, it's probably the first time we've had a, a, a decent effort at running him half a dozen times in the trot, if you like. In the past, he's shown that he's very capable, but just niggly things get in his way. I think he had a window, I think, down at um, Pike Hall. I think maybe as a four-year-old early in his career, he had to get a window up then. Um, so he's finally putting it all together. But as I say, it's not a surprise to me um, that he's, he's where he is just now. You know, and as with Joseph, I mean, you know, you're talking about a real player here. Um, but you're drawn on the wide outside. You know, Merrington moving up has been, I suppose, one of the star paces of the, of the 2020 season. He's got the inside berth. What are you thinking going into this? Yeah. Uh, um... As Joseph said, number one is not always the best position to be in at Tour Prince. I think, I think Rocker might just about have enough force to get to the first corner in front. I think, I mean, it's really difficult to see. As Joseph says, things change in a race. Looking at the race, I think Rock and Mambo will go for the front and will get there. I think it's only a matter whether it's around the first corner, whether it's down the back street. Rocker will hold them as long as he feels that he needs to. And then he'll probably, I think, maybe release him. I think Rock and Mambo's last start back, I think it was the day Cash All won with Michael O'Malley. Rock and Mambo came from the fourth line and got to the front in the half in 57 and three, I think it was. If you watch the, the, the race, I think he would be maybe 30 yards back at the start. So Rock and Mambo's probably that day went a 55 and a piece first half. And, and I don't think that I can tell, I don't think any other horse in the UK has ever went that, ever, 55 half. So I, I'm guessing Rocky Mambo will definitely get the front at some stage. Probably, Joseph will probably be first up near Paparazzi. He seems to like to run that way as well, um, looking for a gap. I think there'll be a whole lot of pace early on in the race. When it's a big race like this, prestige and money, yeah, people force out pretty quick. Miraculous, again, another horse really, really fast away. Really fast away. We saw him doing it at Port Marnock last year when he went 55. And off the back of his first win last week, um, he should be probably a bit of confidence in his ability as well. Again, it's T Tetrick. He's only raced five times this year, Tetrick, and he's been a month off now. So he'd be one that would do the closing. I think if the, the horse is in the front, Mambo and moving up too quick, then there'll be closers that will be coming in and, and maybe picking up the pieces, I think. But um, as Joseph said, the race can go anyway, but that's the way I would think it would go. I've just been talking to Michael O'Mahony. Um, of course, he's sitting behind Loose Change, a filly you know really well. Yeah. Yeah, again, probably not got the most gate speed. She will pace for two or three miles in under 30 seconds, no problem. She just doesn't have that zip off the gate. The race is going to be set up pretty much to suit her as well here. I think, if I'm honest, if I was thinking if I was sitting with Cash All in that position there, I would be I would be fairly confident about being a player right at the end. There's no question about it. But she's certainly she keeps pacing. So the quicker they go in the front end, the more it will suit her. So she's definitely I mean she's paced 58 and a bit through Tier Prince this year already, albeit she's been chasing Newtown Jody. She's seemed to have spent most of the year chasing her round about. Um, but she's certainly got plenty of ability um, uh, and a fantastic mayor. So she's not without a chance either. And she knows the track really well. You know, as you say, stated, you know, she's been a Tier Prince this year. She's been a Tier Prince last year, multiple uh, Group 1 winner. Uh, Cash Hall's record at Tier Prince, what would that be? 
I, I was actually trying to think if he's ever actually been to Tier Prince. I think maybe he has, maybe just the once. So he's never yeah. been to Tier Prince. It, should, it shouldn't bother him, I wouldn't think, one little bit. <clears throat> Loose change certainly goes better around Tier Prince in York. Big, wider bends. He seems to handle those much better. I don't see the big problem with Cash All. I mean, he has got <clears throat> blister and pace away. He has got real, real quick turn of foot. But from the seven hole there, paparazzi and mambo, miraculous, these horses inside of you, pro. everybody's going to have to push out anyway and make their decision what to do just going into the first corner. But we shall see. Well, it's, a, it's behind closed doors, remember, folks, on Sunday. It is trainers, drivers, grooms only. But the, the meeting will be live streamed. So we are expecting... We are, we are expecting to be inundated with people watching it on the live stream on uh, Sunday afternoon. A race to savour. A race to savour indeed, Sarah. What's your reading of this year's renewal? I couldn't pick a winner. If I didn't have a vested interest um, in a couple of these horses, I wouldn't be able to pick a winner. In all honesty, it's... I know we've talked about, I've talked about this with a few different people, the way the season's panned out, and I know I mentioned this to you on Sunday, we've had horses that were in the original running of this race that have subsequently left the country. There's been horses that have finished up for the season, and people have said, oh, this crop of gold isn't going to be as good a crop of gold as previous years, because it's maybe not full of what you would class as true free-for-allers. And yet, in the last couple of weeks, the way that some of these horses have started to shape up in their races, it's turned out to be a race full of the horses that are genuinely going the best in the country at this given time. There's horses that have been racing really well during the course of the season that haven't turned up for this because for one reason or another, they've just fallen by the wayside. Their seasons have finished. Connections maybe just haven't fancied entering the race in light of some of the performances that some of the horses have put in the, in the past couple of weeks. Look, to me, it's as good a crock of gold as we ever could have hoped for at the start of the season. It's as good a crock of gold as we've seen in previous years. I don't, you know, I don't want to criticise any horse coming into this, even though some of these horses are what you would maybe sometimes class as just high-grade handicappers. Um, the fact is that they've been racing really, really competitively, doing really, really good times for the previous weeks and consistently doing that as well. Um, so I think there's a, there's a case to be made for every single one of these horses in the race. I've obviously got a favourite that I've banged on about all summer. Um, so obviously I want Air Paparazzi to win. Um, but having said that, Hugh is driving a horse that I've been so, so impressed with in the last couple of weeks. Um, there was a couple of people at Corbywood who had talked about wanting to buy a horse uh, about a month ago. And I'd said, well, Cashel might be a horse that you can maybe buy. He seems fairly consistent. He's not too high up in the handicap system. You know, a Seacast driver could maybe take him to York, a place like that, get a 10 yard lift or a 20 yard lift. I don't think there's a huge amount of money in buying Cashel. And I was given every excuse under the sun as to why he wasn't a suitable horse to purchase. And then he went out and went 156 and 8 in York. And then the following day went 2 2 at Corby Woods, and then the following week went 157 at York. So I didn't think my judgment was too far away with Tashel. Um, and if Air Paparazzi couldn't win it, then I would definitely be cheering on Tashel at the finish. You've got to because of the, the company we're keeping tonight. Even if, look, if we'd had Rocker on, if we'd had Rocker and Steve and Eves and Mark Jones on, I'd uh, still say Air Paparazzi, followed by Tashel. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, I'll believe you. I'll believe you. And then, of course, Sarah, I was saying to the guys off air, you know, it is good luck to appear on the Sulky Show. So I'm trying to work out now what's going to happen. We're either going to have a, a miraculous uh, Ian Wood son of a gun type dead heat between Cash All and Air Paparazzi. Uh, Joseph, you, have you got any other drives? You haven't, have you? No, just, just no. the one. So, so that means if it's not the dead heat, you're going to win the crop and Hugh's going to win <laughs> with Rob Hall. I'll take that deal. Yeah. <laughs> you will you take that? Oh, <laughs> right now. If I can one second with cash all. Right, right. Um, moving away from the crop, you 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 know I've just mentioned now you're driving Rob Hall in um, a heat of the Green Hornet handicap. What about his form? He's, he's won. I see he's won a couple of times this year. Yeah, yeah, he's he's a tough sort that um that really really tries each time. He's he's probably I would say, in fact, definitely the toughest horse I've ever sat behind. 
There's no quit in him. He keeps going and keeps going and keeps going. I think, I, I mean, I think the race he's, he's got, a, it's going to probably set up okay for him. I think he's got a fairly good chance in the race. Uh, looking at it, I think GM's Macy Hofstaff, Air Pioneer, GM's Macy Hofstaff from the inside, plenty pace. I think it'll definitely lead the gate. Late side Paddy, I think, um, I think it won the consolation last week for the star makers. And it's probably, and I think it led, so he might fancy his chances going to the front as well. So Bobby Camden, again, these kind of horses don't get to gate that often, so it's hard to judge how quick they are away. I think maybe Rocco will be happy to take a good seat there and sit and wait. He was the one that came and beat me with Rob Hall last week at York. He came, he beat me fairly comfortably, but I did give him a couple of lengths of a start, a couple of lines of a start, and I, I did get a tough, tough trip with Rob Hall, two and three wide at bits. So if I can get maybe a, a drop in and get a better position, I will keep marching forward. It's the only way he knows to go. It's the only way really to drive him. So I think I would probably be disappointed if he didn't make the first three in that race. Right, OK. So that's Rob Hall in the in that heat of the, the, the Green Hornets handicap. Sarah, you have you had a good look at the card? I want to say yes, but you wouldn't believe me if you did. So, no, I have not had a good look at the card. I've looked at one race, okay, and I have not worked back through the rest of them. Look, the, the race that you're on about now, Rob Hall's race, that's another really, really competitive one. Um, in terms of the horses, Harry that obviously won a couple of weeks ago. I thought Harry went all right on Sunday, just gone. I, that the, the final that he was in there was full of really, really quality horses. Um, and it was just a case of on the day better horses beat him, I think. And and I spoke to Stephen Lees afterwards and he said the horse gave him a really nice spin round there. He really enjoyed it. He thought he'd done a good time. You know, they kept out of trouble and they picked up a little bit of prize money. Uh, it was it was quite a big ask, really, when you consider he was racing against Miraculous, who's dropped into the crop of gold now instead of his handicap. Um, Enter the Dragon and picked up a place behind their regal a couple of weeks ago. Maybe slightly outclassed in this race again, because Lakeside Paddy I was impressed on Sunday as well. We knew Lakes of Paddy was a good horse because he'd won earlier in the season in very, very hot company. Um, and I think at, at this stage in the season, I think if you're winning races, going back the next week to win again is, is slightly easier. You, you've already run into your kind of peak fitness now. Lakes of Paddy just looks like he's hit a bit of form at the right time. Um, and Bobby Camden, I can't remember the last time Bobby Camden raced the Tear Prince, if he has at all. He maybe did when he was a lot younger, but it's been a long time. He's been all his work this year has been at, at York. Uh, he's come to Corbywood a couple of times. It'd be interesting to see how Bobby goes there because he was a horse that we said previously wasn't really a hard track horse. Um, and his first sub two minute mile of his career came middle of September, which we consider he's five years old. It's, it's taken him a bit of time to get to that. But that said, he has raced really well at York. He was a winner last week, so he does come to Pier Prince in good form as well. Wide open race. I don't think he was wrong to be confident in finishing in the first three there because Rob Hall is, is a superstar. He's been a superstar for a long time. And, and he's he knows what hard work is, he knows what hard racing is, and he doesn't seem to shy away from it. So um, I think Rob Hall and Eric, or those the two horses in that race that I'd like to see in the first three and probably to make it up. I'm going to say Bobby Camden, which means that Kate Parry, when she watches this, is going to be throwing her Lumen burgers out the window and she's not going to send them to me because I've not picked the Lakeside Paddy, but I'd like to see Bobby Camden finish those three as well in that race. OK. Uh, the, um, the Heat winners and the five fastest losers... Uh, combined will qualify for the final uh, the the following week and it's great guys that the season's continuing I I know Hugh you know Hamish he's a he's a big a big fan of you know keeping the show on the road and extending the season oh of that there is no question he has <laughs> done I think he's done more travelling than Alan Wicker and that's <laughs> for, the, for the for the younger generation who doesn't know who Alan Wicker is he did a lot of air miles when holiday shows. But yeah, he, he trucks up and down that road, York, faithfully every week. Um, Tug Prince as well, so he's planning on going back down next week. So yeah, I mean, it's their life. It's That's that's what they do. They work hard and they get the rewards in the end by, by getting winners. So yeah, you, you could take nothing away from them. They do they do a lot, a lot of miles. I think we'll be, I'll leave, we'll leave the stable on Sunday morning, probably just before five, I would think to get there and it was pretty much the same going to York the 11 o'clock starts you've got to be in the, the lorry and ready to go at 5 
Amy, she's up before four feeding them in their breakfast in the morning. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's, that's what you call devotion and dedication. <laughs> Absolutely. It's great the season's continuing there. I know they're having um, another handicap later in November with, uh, I think it's heats on the 15th and uh, final on the, the, the 22nd. Um, guys, we, we, one or two issues on the on the harness racing front at the moment. At the moment, there's a, a look into um, into handicapping. I mean, what are your thoughts, Hugh, on, on, uh, on handicap systems that you've seen in Britain over the years? Because I'm not wanting to call you a, a veteran but you've probably seen one or two handicap systems yeah yeah i have right back to the days of the, the time handicap system I, I do believe in a system of some type or some sort i feel i feel and i think i'm probably not the only one that would say this they don't seem to leave any handicap system in place for a, a whole long time to so if you've got a system in place you can develop and resources to suit that system that's in place. The minute you try to do that and you think, well, this horse is going to be fine, we we'll do some winter racing or whatever, they change the goalposts. Dan, I, I, I like the idea that if we just let it settle and bed in, we could adjust. I remember many years ago when my, when my father was the chairman, and it was the time handicapping system then, and there was a gentleman that, at one of the, the, the meet, meetings, I'd asked him, well, my horse can only go 212. How, how, can, how can it win a race when everything else is going 26, 27, 210, whatever it was? And the kind of argument went back and forth for a wee bit. And eventually my dad gave up and said, well, look, it's like this. I won't name a gentleman. He said, your horse isn't going as quick as that, then maybe you need to think about getting another horse. So uh, th things are moving on. The, the, the horses now are that much more athletic. Um, back in the day when I started driving, it was you, you would go in to, to work a horse through the news, his fast work through the week and that, you would probably have to take your training stick and, and keep them going. Nowadays, you don't hardly need a stick. They know what they're doing, they're athletic, they try hard for the mile and they go in the race. I think it's, it's really difficult getting a system to fit. We don't have horses, Darren, for one. If we had went back maybe 30 years to the system we've got in place just now, we would probably be getting on a whole lot better. It's it's just the number of horses. You, you are never going to please everybody all the time. It's just an impossibility. So probably people need to think about it. And if your horse isn't good enough, and I know they become part of the family because it happens to me as well, and you want to keep them going as long as you can, once they stop becoming competitive, it's difficult. Yeah, yeah. And and Joseph, do you have a view on the the handicap system? To be honest with you, Darren, I, I don't really understand it. Maybe as as well as you or yourself or, or Sarah would understand it. So there's not really much light I can shed on the situation. Um, I will just turn up and race and and go where where I get put. So um, I don't really I don't really know too much about. It, to be honest with you, obviously I understand how it works, but in terms of of changing the system of how other systems work better than the one we've got now or worse or what that I don't really know too much about it to be honest with you. And Sarah, you've always said said that you you'd rather sit back and let others study the systems. Yeah, that remains the same. I've had this conversation <laughs> with my dinner. Um I've had uh, somebody on last night wanting to send a proposal to me wanting to go through, I think the proposal that's on the cards at the moment with the rating system, and I just said, I don't want anything to do with it. I don't understand it. <clears throat> I mean, I barely understand the system we've got right now. I couldn't tell you what the money bands are. I understand that we've got a grade system, and it's one to 10, and I understand that it is based on money's one, but I don't, I've never studied it close enough to understand if I had a horse racing, how much prize money I can pick up before I'm jumped up into the next band or whatever. Like, I would just rely on the BHRC to tell me what grade my horse is, and that's it any alternative system I don't it makes it sound like I don't want to get involved in it because I, I like I'm not interested I am interested my main interest is that horses can stay in training for as long as possible that they're not sold to Wales and Water Counties or to Ireland to Cork or whatever and you know they continue to be competitive there but they can't be competitive with us that's my main interest how we go about achieving that it's not that I don't want to help, it's that I don't know what the answer is. And I just think there's people that are better placed to, to come up with suggestions and, and ideas to make that happen. I think 
kind of what Hugh has said a little bit in that sometimes we need to give them, like whatever system we go with, we just need to give it time to bed in and actually adapt once we see how it affects the horses we've got. It's all very well building a system around the horses that we've got right now, but the horses that we've got racing right now aren't going to be the horses we've got racing over the next couple of seasons. And it will, the landscape of the horses racing will change. So chances are the handicap system needs to adapt slightly to it. And there's not going to be a one size fits all and it's going to work straight away. It's it's kind of need to change little things that are going along, see how it kind of pans out, see what the outcome is. But ultimately you need to have an end goal and then work out how you're going to get to it. And the end goal should be to keep horses in training as long as possible uh, and keep them competitive for as long as possible. Then you have to work your way backwards as to how you're going to achieve that. Um, and like I said, there's, there's people that are far more knowledgeable on this, that have got far more experience in this, that would be far better at, at coming up with something. I've only been in the sport since 2008, so it's a miracle I've climbed as high as I have in the last 12 years, from looking at stables to being the, uh, the glamorous car for the soccer show. <laughs> right, thanks, Sarah. Um, uh, Joseph, stop hiding behind that cushion. What's behind that Coffin. cushion? I'm coughing. <laughs> <laughs> right, OK. Not laughing at Sarah. <laughs> no. He is now. <laughs> um, Joseph, you know, talking about your your career in the sulky. I mean, how many years have you been driving now? Um, I passed my driving test in um, 2014. Um, I didn't really have much racing experience the year I passed my test. Um, I had done like done bits and bobs and I passed my test, but I really, like, I never come back to it in, in 15. I started driving it back again in 2016. Um, and I, I got in with a stable with um, Matty Quinn and Danielle Giraldi and stuff, and, and I picked up quite a lot of drives off them, to be honest with you. Um, at one point, I was I was their main driver. I was driving pretty much all their horses. Um, so that's where I, I learned, really, most of me... Of, of the job that I, that I know is is with them and obviously I'm, I'm thankful I got the drives and, and, and appreciate it because if if I didn't I wouldn't be not that I am anywhere but I wouldn't be where I am now in terms of, of me driving I've learned learned everything I know to be honest we've learned a lot so that's um I haven't been driving or involved in it for quite a long time it's only a, a short period of time compared to quite a few other people but I'm really enjoying it to be honest with you and it, would you have a preference, pacer, trotter? Both, to be honest with you, both. Um, I actually, I do like driving the trotters. I have drove a few trotters. So they're a bit more of a task to drive. So that's why I like driving them. Um, pacing, pacing horses, you're a bit more safer. So you can sort of have a little bit more fun sort of thing. You're not um, constantly watching if, 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 if it's going to go off its legs like the trotters can do. But... I'll drive anything to be honest with you. As long as long as I'm in a race, I'm, I'm happy whether I come last, whether I come first, whether I finish in the middle of the pack. I always enjoy it. So as long as I'm in a race. So you've been driving a few years, and here you are with a big chance in the the, the most prestigious race in the country. No, oh, no, I know. Tell us about it. I was looking at the um, the card last night to be honest with you, and the drivers and horses what's in there. And for us, for us just to be in this race is good enough for us. It's, it's big enough for us, you know. Um, I know there's a lot of people wanted to be in the race for years. And like I say, we're lucky enough to have dropped onto a horse on our first season. And for the success we've had and to be in this race is, it's like I say, it's, it's marvellous for us to be honest with you. We, we can get over it. Yeah. And listen, it's, it's not a dream. You're there. You are there. It is reality. Oh, of course. Definitely. Listen, it's... It, it is a dream and, and, and it is reality. It's sort of a, a dream that we've been lucky enough to fulfil, do you know what I mean? So I just hope it gives other people the, the, the hope and whatever else it is they need to, to go out and get it done. Because if, if we can do it, then there's no reason why anyone else can do it, you know? We're not yeah. professional trainers. What we do this as, as a hobby. Um, we've got our, our livelihood to get on with and we've got work to do and, and stuff. So we've got to train our horse and do the sport around all that. So, like I say, if we can do it, anyone can do it. Now, Hugh, um, talking about one or two issues, we spoke about handicapping. Uh, regarding the whip, we've spoken to, to a few of the, the guys over the last few weeks about the whip, and, you know, it's a, it's a very contentious issue, both in uh, harness and thoroughbred racing, and we're seeing lots of the big jurisdictions now in both sports 
um, look, reviewing their, their whip regulations, uh, tightening them up. What are your thoughts uh, regarding the, the, the current rules and what we should be doing, what, how we can improve? Hmm. Yeah, Dan, I, I believe I, I could probably live without the whip. As I said earlier, as I touched on earlier, most of the horses, most of the horses nowadays are pretty athletic. They pretty much go and they try hard for you. Um, they're not as, maybe stuffy is not a good word, but they're not as stuffy as they used to be 30 years ago. They're, they're athletes and they go and they try hard. For the vast majority, I would say, for the vast majority of horses, I, I could live without a whip. They try hard for you. Um, sometimes, again, young horses schooling them, looking after them, you probably need a whip just to, to educate them a bit. Um, it's, a, it's a difficult one. Um, if you'd asked me that 20, 30 years ago, I would say they need, you need a whip. Um, nowadays, I would say probably not so much. Um, tightening down on the probably is a good thing. It's, it's happened far more this year than I have and I can recall there was one or two incidents in York, to be honest, were disgraceful, um, shocking. Uh, so, yeah, the need to be stiffer. Um, probably, there's probably a need for it for the odd horse. Uh, right, okay. Um... Again, we, you just, it's a very, very contentious issue. Uh, there's a lot of people saying it's about the technique as well. Joseph, have you got any thoughts on, on this subject? I mean, I, personally, myself, I, I, I think not so much need a whip, but I, I think putting a whip ban in place and driving without a whip, I do think you would lose quite a lot of competitive racing. Um, personally, myself, if I can drive a horse around the track, and don't have to use the whip at all. It's it's a job well done as far as I'm concerned. Um, but I think it's just I don't know. I think it's sort of like for a driver, it's more of a tool than anything else. And it's like if you ask a mechanic to fix a car without using a spanner, then he could probably do do it quite a lot of times. But it's it's going to boil down. To, he's going to get the job. What's well, a bit of an awkward one where he's going to need a spanner to fix it. So it's sort of like with drivers, the whip's a tool, you know. So you're going to get horses where you're going to need that tool to drive them. Um, like you said before, you get young horses that need educated and schooled on and stuff. And I've drove horses myself. That's that'll give you everything, but they'll they'll shy at something at the edge of the track, you know. And if they hadn't have been checked into place and, and, and sent on to run forward, it could, could have caused an accident. Um, so I just, this, I think it's it, it's an important tool to have with you as a driver, like I say, especially with young horses and stuff. But I do think in competitiveness, as long as it's used correctly, I think um, I think it's a, a thing the driver should be able to carry the runs with you. And, and Hugh, you mentioned about the horses. You know, you, you say horses, I think you use the word stuffy, less stuffy now. It, again, you've seen it with the, the way horses are trained. You know, surely you've seen you've you've seen the um, train the training of uh, paces and trotters evolve over the years. Well, well, Dan, uh, yeah, th they're certainly getting better. I think probably the the most important fact is the breeding. The breeding has got so much better. They're flipping over generations every five six years now. Uh, certainly, they are in the states and Australia. These three three year olds retired, go to stud the best three-year-old fillies go to them. So the, the generations are turning quicker. The training methods, not, I mean, uh, it's, it's a difficult one. It's Most people do the same. They jog their horse and they'll give it a workout, bring it down gradually, going through the start of the season, get it racing. The, 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 yeah, there's, there's more equipment now to help your horse um, than there ever was before. The training methods, no, I would say probably the breeding would be the main factor. The feeding would probably be the the next factor. Training and then maybe driving. They're the kind of things that have, that have helped. But when I started driving, there was very few catch drivers, if you like. It was you, you went with your family, it was your uncle that drove the horse, it was your brother, it was your cousin, it was the family had a driver, and that could change from week to week, which one depending on how well he did the week before. There was not a lot of catch drivers. Now 
there just seems to be there seems to be a lack of drivers, especially young drivers. Um, I think maybe the most important thing, or one of the most important things in the sport, is getting young drivers in. Joseph there just said, Joseph's probably now hooked. Joseph's probably now in this sport for the rest of his life. He's been hooked in a great sport because he's been getting in through the driving. I remember when I was working the horses out when I was younger, and it was my, my uncle John Mingus that would, would train them, would, would drive them in a race, or my uncle Henry. And I, I would work them with my brother and my sister, and I could just pretty much guarantee that I could get the horse to go, say, say 2.15, and I thought it was going great. And for some reason, my uncle, one of them, whichever one, would jump on the horse and suddenly go five seconds quicker. And I could never work it out. I could never understand how that was possible. It's just one of these things that experience is a great thing as a driver. The more races you're in, you don't necessarily need to win races. The more races you're in, Joseph will tell you this now, that his air paparazzi that he's got has is, is been a fantastic horse for him. It's taught Joseph things uh, already in this season, um, just being on behind a good, good horse. Everybody kind of needs a good horse to teach them. I had one many years ago as well. It was a good journeyman. He taught me a whole lot. But I think there's a problem. We need younger drivers. We have no younger drivers. It could be with this season with people scrambling, scrambling around trying to find drivers. We've only got, I mean, I think, off the top of my head, Ryan Ingalls is a good, good young up and coming driver in Scotland. But other than that, there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of young drivers getting in the sport. So that, that needs to be probably addressed. And, and how can we do that? Well, any ideas? I suppose give them give them a chance. I'm, I, I probably, I, I say a C-class driver doesn't necessarily mean they're young. I, I wouldn't say I'm a big fan of C-class drivers' races. I would say probably the C-class drivers will learn more from being in a race with experienced drivers. Um, C-class drivers, a whole bunch of them in a race with maybe one or two horses that are maybe a bit erratic. It's not a good combination. Um, you need you need to learn. I remember. I can still remember my first drive, Dan, at Corby Wood, and, and it was all I thought about. I just like Joseph. I would be maybe about I don't know seventeen, maybe something like that, when I had my first drive, and it was all I thought. I want to drive. I want to drive. And as I said, it was my uncle that was driving at the time. So I think I got my first drive, and I was buzzing for the week. I got on. I, I, I had my race, and I remember it, it was like sir. Ian Bell, James Morton, I think Willie Morton, one or two other good drivers of the day um, were in the race. Came off the race <laughs> and I thought, that's not for me. There was a lot of shouting and cursing and wheels banging and I came off and I thought, that's not for me. Um, but I, I persevered and, and I, I started to enjoy it and get more relaxed. Um, and you need young drivers to get that opportunity. You need them. You just need to get more young drivers. Whether I know they've got a kind of C class allowance, maybe a young drivers allowance or something, just to get them involved and get more involved. But uh, how you would go about it? There is a lot of young kids go to the track. I remember Ryan Ingalls, as I say, he's a Scottish young driver in Scotland now coming up through the ranks, doing very well. He used to go. Um, his grandfather, Alan McDonald, was a great amateur. Thomas Horseman, um, he used to go there, he used to come to the trotting every week, he would speak to me, he would chat, and he was dead keen, he would do anything. He would, uh, when I started driving down there, we probably walked to Appleby to drive a horse that had no chance in the rain. Um, nowadays, I'm maybe not quite that way. But you've got to get them when they're young and keen, um, and get them involved early, and they'll stay involved. How you go about it is a different story, I'm not quite so sure. I think, I think it all stems from getting more people interested in harness racing as well. That's something we have to do. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, that's fair. I always I like to ask, I like to find out how people people got involved in the sport. I remember you said yourself uh, um, a few weeks ago, I think it was in the Sulky Show or some minute of you, how you got you got involved. I think you were asked along to commentate in a race at Dear Prince. Um, I remember one story from years ago. Um, a man that used to he's, he's dead now, John Fowler. He used to have a few horses at Corby Wood. Um, racing every week and he had a bit of success and he did okay uh, and I asked him one day how he got involved and he told me in the day he called me when it was at his best it was busiest there was, there was a thousand people or more going in there every week they had police up guiding the traffic out at night it was that busy that's the truth Dan and I remember he said he said I got involved because I was a policeman 
And I used to do the Thursday night shifts up at Corby Wood, guiding the traffic out. He said, I got talking to people. And he says, I got interested and I got involved and I got a share in one. And before you knew it, I had one myself. And I was training them. You just need to get people with probably with an equine background, get them involved, get them interested, get them on the horses. I mean, it's, it's, it's an addictive sport once you get in, as you know yourself. It's, it's getting them in, get a foothold is, is the way forward. But uh, like I say, how we do it, um, it's getting more and more professional now, Dad. So I do know that we need new blood, young blood in. You're steeped in harness racing, aren't you? It's it's in your blood. I mean, you know, the family is steeped. You, you said your father was indeed chairman of the BHRC. Yeah, yeah. Well, my father was involved. He got involved through, I think, he got involved through my, his brother, my Uncle John. Uh, I, I suppose this is a blame game, I suppose. And my Uncle John, he got involved through his girlfriend, or wife, became his wife, Myra Cowan. So Will Cowan from Salman and the Holocaust contracted. Uh, he had a lot of horses, and that's how my Uncle John got involved, um, and then dragged my dad involved, got him involved, and then my dad's two other brothers, they both got involved as well. So, yeah, it's getting people in and getting them involved. Once they realise that it's fun, um, it, people people stay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Sarah, any, 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 any ideas then, how we can get a few more people through the gates and Get them closer to the action. I think I've spoken to you about this before, Hugh, about the idea with the pony clubs and doing yeah. the um, like visits and stuff to Hamishers. When I was working down in Wales with Colin Bevan, I, I invited my local pony club up. We, Colin Bevan and his wife Shirley and me and a couple of others, we were responsible for promoting the meeting at Kilmary. So what we did maybe like three weeks before the meeting at Kilmary was we had the local pony club over, took them for a little tour around the yard, like harness the horse up and stuff, gave them a talk through all the harness I've got used, put the jog cart on, let the kids sit in the jog cart. Obviously, for safety reasons, we couldn't actually let them jog the horses, but we got them, we gave them a chance to sit, have their photos taken, and then took them up to the track and watched the horses working out on the track. And then at the end of it, we obviously the children were going to get into the meeting for free anyway because most of them were under 16, but we gave their parents one free ticket to get in on the basis that we thought maybe both the parents would come along and at least one parent was going to pay for them into the meeting. But we didn't mind giving those free tickets away because otherwise they weren't going to come at all. And from that little kind of plan that I had, one of the girls that came along, who was maybe about 14 or 15, she actually contacted me after that and said, is there any chance I can come along to another race meeting with you just to help out? So I ended up taking her to Alan's Mall. I mean, I didn't really need any help because we only had three or four horses that summer, but she came along with me. And she continued to want to come along with me. Her parents were happy for her to just jump in the lorry with us and go for a day out. I was responsible for her. You know, she was she was picking up as we were going along. She was learning to harness the horses up. She was happy to walk them around because she obviously had that horsey background anyway from being a pony club. Um, she never stuck it out after I left anyway because other things kind of happen. People go to university, whatever, and her life moves on and stuff. But getting people, getting young people like that who've already got a horsey background makes it easier. It's, it, it, that's how it kind of appealed to me. Like, I didn't have a harness racing background. I just grew up with horses and got that opportunity from Colin Bevan to start working with his horses. And that was the point at which I got completely hooked on. It was when he started taking me to the races. Um, I know he's kind of talked about, like, young drivers of COVID. We have had a massive shortage of drivers of COVID this year. I think there was a meeting where we had nine drivers drive across the, the six races. That was it. And you were getting the, the card out in the middle of the week, the start sheet, and... Willie Greenhorn's down to drive four horses in the same race and people are scrambling around trying to find a driver. There have been young drivers at Corby. I'm using Corby because it's my local chat, but there have been young drivers at Corby over the years. I have I mean, I use C-class drivers anyway. I've used, in the six years I've been here, I've used four different C-class drivers. Um, and of those four C-class drivers, only one of those has actually progressed up to a B-class and continue driving. The other three have all kind of dropped by the wayside for one reason or another. Um, they're still involved, they've still got horses, but driving just turned out not to be something they wanted to do. And I don't know how you kind of keep that going because it's not, it's not always that there's something in the sport that's not keeping them in it. Sometimes it is personal reasons. Some people just don't like it for whatever reason. Um, but I mean, if you use Ryan Ingalls as an example, I know I speak to Ryan a lot and he's 
over the years, he struggled to get drives because there's no incentive for people to use him as a driver because Corby Woods, the SHRC, is members are greatly against keeping that uh, lift that C-class drivers get another tracks across the country. So there's no incentive for a trainer to get him to drive. He's going around asking people for drives, but people are kind of prefer more experienced drivers, of which we have got. We've got a really strong pool of drivers at Corby Wood anyway, but he's, his only option really then was to go out and buy a horse. And that isn't necessarily an ideal scenario for a lot of young people. But back in the day, like it's a sport where people can buy a horse. You can train it yourself, you can drive it yourself, you can do everything yourself, it's great. But for a young person in this day and age, when you've got the cost of living as it is and everything else going on, it's not the easiest thing to go out and buy a horse by yourself, particularly if your parents aren't directly involved in the sport. So you need to find the incentive for, it's not so much the incentive for people to keep driving necessarily, it's sometimes the incentive for trainers to use these fast drivers. I personally don't need an incentive. I'm quite happy to put a young driver on my horses because I want people to get a chance to drive. Um, you know, I've, I use George Carson as an example. George Carson drove for me multiple times and never I never utilized the 10 yard or 20 yard lift that he was eligible for uh, i just let him drive my horses because he wanted to drive and because i knew my horses were safe enough for him to drive um but not everybody wants to put a c-class driver on their horses and if i don't all the time either i mean hugh's driven for me multiple times now and i think nine times out of ten i would rather put hugh on my horse than george carson but um sorry george well um, hugh's never put back driving sometimes. for you hello Hugh's never looked back since driving for you. No, I know. He's, I mean, I've propelled him into um, like the stratosphere. He's now one of the like best drivers in the country, and it's all because of me. It's yeah. not. He was always a good driver anyway. But um, but yeah, I had to interview him once. I was the winning owner, and I had to interview him at Appleby. And it was like, uh, what was it like driving my horse? Be nice, because um, otherwise I won't let you drive him again. <laughs> so 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 you um you prefer driving horses than dealing with technology yes yes drive horses any day fiddle about with phones and computers not for me you've done a good job tonight though i mean this is it now we've sold the concept yeah my, my technical advisor my wife she's away with her mother in the caravan for um until sunday so um, I was panicking a bit about this, but it's, it's worked. I've just not touched the phone. I've just left it as it is, and it's fine. <laughs> so are you going to be on this all night, then? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how to switch it off, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brilliant. Superb. Um, listen, guys, I've really enjoyed tonight. It's been fantastic. And, you know, I, I wish you both the very best. Genuinely, sincerely wish you, wish you both the very best on Sunday. Um, in, in the Crocker Gold. Fantastic race. You're driving two very, very talented horses. Thanks for joining us tonight. Um, you know, good luck, Joseph. Good luck, you. And it's been really fascinating. Great insight uh, into, into the sport and into your experiences. Uh, uh, what, Sarah, do you want to close the show? Any thoughts? That's a very broad um, invitation. I've got thoughts and I'm not saying this, but um, harness racing related. No, nothing at all. We've covered everything. I can't wait for Sunday. I've never been as excited uh, for a race meeting all season as I am for this Sunday. And I've been pretty excited every week. So um, there's going to be very little sleep between now and Sunday for me because it's all I can think about. Right. Well, thank you very much. Th thanks, guys. And good luck at the weekend. Thank you very much for, thank you, Dan. For, for joining us tonight. Yeah, thank you very much as well. Thanks for having us on. Thank you, Dan. All right. All the best. Bye-bye. Good night.